Hey everyone! Today we're going to be talking about the startup ecosystem in the Philippines. The Philippines is the second most populated country in Southeast Asia, with around 108 million people living in the country. I'm so psyched to be talking about the Filipino startup ecosystem, especially with exits like Coins.ph, which happened in 2019 when it was acquired by Gojek for $72 million, making it the largest exit out of the country for a tech company. Today, we have the executive director of Ideaspace, which is one of the earlier incubators in the Philippines based out of Manila. So let's welcome her to the show. Hi, I'm Dana Yao, your host on the Emerging Markets Tech Startups podcast. While traveling to over 90 countries, I was inspired by the entrepreneurial spirit across startup communities in Africa, Latin America, Asia, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. On the show, we bring you stories from entrepreneurs, startup ecosystem innovators, and investors. We discuss what makes these markets culturally and historically unique, local trends, local challenges consumers and founders face, and the opportunities. Let's get started. So Diane, it is so great to have you joining us from Manila, from the Philippines today to talk about the Filipino startup ecosystem. Hello, everyone. And uh, I'm Diane, and I run an accelerator in the Philippines. So we're so curious, just kind of get us started about you. You've lived there all your life, I'm assuming. What do we have to know about the Philippines? Um, what's exciting about the Philippines? Oh, just, just so much. <laughs> For one, uh, e-commerce, fintech, and logistics are huge. Uh, there's a huge opportunity. I'd like to think it's because of the geology of the Philippines. If you look at our country in the map, it's an archipelago of 7,100 islands. So just moving goods from one island to the other is a logistics challenge. <laughs> I'm not saying it's a nightmare. It used to be a nightmare, but now um, better infrastructure has been put in place with internet penetration um, connecting the islands a lot. There's a lot of better movement of goods from island to island. So um, with that... Is infrastructure a challenge? It used to be, but... Uh, in the large sense, um, government and um, private sector have been infusing a lot of capital to improve infrastructure. So roads, um, what do you call this? Water, water transportation, wharfs and piers and airports, um, train systems. Um, that kind of hard stuff, hardware, <laughs> and then also the technology infrastructure is also um, continuously being put in place. It's still nothing, I mean, it's not, not comparable to maybe other parts of Southeast Asia, but the efforts have been, been significant in the last few years. Do you know what the penetration of internet access is in the Philippines? The internet penetration, I just quickly Googled, it's about between 67 to 70 percent. It depends on, depends on who, you're, who you're quoting, yeah. And then the economy itself, what is it made up of? Like you mentioned farmers, so is agriculture still a big part? The biggest contributor to the Philippine economy right now is the services sector. So business process outsourcing, I think that's uh, one of the biggest contributors. And then we have a large segment of our population abroad. So overseas Filipino workers, uh, foreign, remit foreign remittance is a major contributor <laughs> to money, the, the source of money in uh, for, for many people. When did this population of people moving abroad started happening? Was it in the like 80s, 90s? 
think the Philippines has always exported labor. <laughs> even before the even in the 1940s, <laughs> we had a lot of the the pineapple plantations in Hawaii were employing Filipinos even before in the 1940s. And then um, well, it increased um, a lot in the 80s. And then it's been part of the Filipino culture for a family member to go abroad. And uh, almost every Filipino family has a member abroad, a family member abroad. Do you feel like the everyday person feels comfortable using internet technology? Oh, it's still huge. It's many people are on Facebook. <laughs> TikTok, <laughs> Facebook, TikTok. In fact, uh, uh, one of the most exciting startups in the Philippines, though, uh, is a. Uh, it's called Kumu. Um, it's a social. I I cannot explain what Kumu is, but but um, a lot of people use it um, because it's it's very social. So um, anything social, I think, is. Um, exciting for the for for people i can imagine that filipino people have always been really warm friendly very family oriented the filipino families i know like 10 brothers and sisters a thousand cousins i figure you're going to build something for the philippines the influence of friends and family is very important people don't just go try an app because it's out there and they saw it. Maybe the younger generation are like that, but the older generation, it would have to be with the influence of some family member or friend before they download an app. So I think that's that's a that's a factor that you have to consider if you're going for a B2C market. <laughs> I think though the more exciting part of the Philippines is really B2B. B to B. What are some companies that come to mind for you? The ones who are successful are the B two B startups. They're providing all sorts of solutions. So a lot are um, in efficiency, like workforce uh, monitoring, focused on operations efficiency. It's surprisingly, even large corporations are you are employing and uh, getting startups to help solve their operations, uh, monitoring. And who are the customers? Like, are they bigger companies? Yeah, bigger companies. Um, during the pandemic, though, there was an increase of interest in the SMEs because they, they were severely affected. Maybe many of the brick and mortar, uh, small and medium enterprises that did not use technology, were quite affected. That's where we we also experienced a lot, a number of our startups who maybe into another solution, they, they pivoted very quickly and offered new products to cater to the needs of SMEs or brick and mortar companies. So a lot of them, like with those with a storefront, like a f- actual storefront uh, were forced to uh, form a an e-commerce store so that grew the the e-commerce market in the philippines grew tremendously after covid so i think that's that's a good thing (laughs) you see there are good things that come out of covid i think so the the biggest the biggest winner are are the tech startups lots of interesting facts so far so we were just talking about e-commerce becoming really big. Are there any particular business models that you feel like are really unique? Still your usual subscription model or paper use. So like a monthly subscription for the software, like a SaaS. What are some of the, uh, whether it's companies or these models that are most popular amongst these SMEs? So what I see a lot of is a lot of hyper-local solutions. So it's 
the replication, those like, like say, uh, delivery, <laughs> delivery, food delivery, um, it, there are not very many um, companies or startups say that have done food delivery in one island and then they, they're replicating it and also doing the same system in another island. So the, the number of, of those kinds of startups um, are, are kind of limited, except for like, say, the big ones like Food Panda or Grab. They're, they're able to penetrate different cities and launch in different cities. But then, but those are foreign startups, yes. So I want to, to focus on local startups. Um, they, I see more of a lot of local solutions locally developed in that, say that that town or that city and catering only to that town or that city. If, if, if they expand, they just go to the next town or the next closest city and stay within that province or stay within that island. Is it because they are finding it challenging or their ambitions only take them to the next island? Yeah, I think ambition has a lot to do with it. So again, another unique thing about the Philippines and uh, a criticism of investors is that um, Filipino entrepreneurs are not ambitious enough or don't see the market wide enough. So um, I... I think that's not a bad thing. I think it's really just part of the evolution. When you have more models or more people who've who ventured out and tried larger markets, then other entrepreneurs would would follow suit. So there aren't very many Filipino entrepreneurs who've ventured out of the Philippines. Um, well, coins.ph and maybe Caliber and a and, uh, few others have ventured out. Um, but there isn't that many yet. So mo- when there are more, then more people will start looking at the market beyond their island, beyond the, their region or beyond the Philippines. So I think it's just, uh, it's just a matter of being patient and... Uh, uh, knowing that is part of the evolution of the human capital side of it. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask how much of it is being something in native Filipinos versus something of an early startup ecosystem. Like you had mentioned, exits is key to any startup ecosystem to really gain momentum and f- to attract investors. Because once one exit happens, are able to better imagine that ecosystem having huge potential. So in the Philippines, I guess coins.ph is an example, but have you seen a good number of exits? You mentioned, obviously, exits and founders that have done it before. But what, what is the key unlock here, or is it just a combination of those things? I think it, it isn't just tech talent um, from what I see with um, most of the startups that we deal with it's the the financial and the business it's more of to me the financial talent uh, really understanding how uh, tech and finance the 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 intersection of tech and finance in, in in the growth of a startup. So, and when you say finance, is it things like accounting and understanding yes, gross margin? Yes, and how to continuously provide the capital for the company to grow, um, and then understanding you know when to hire a more senior senior salesperson and then when to bring in a more senior tech person or uh, even, well, 
I think it's also the tech, the, the in understanding the infrastructure they need to build from the beginning. Um, as they start growing, can the tech take take in, you know, um, a thousand customers or ten thousand customers, and then they start, you know, servers start crashing. So understanding all of that and how you need to have the financial resources ahead to be able to be ready to cater to the needs of the customers as you grow. So that kind of expertise and the leadership in the startups, the, it's, still, it's still wanting it there. So my experience with, so we try to get as many corporates to work with the startup. So, cause we're, we're backed by corporates. Um, the challenge of getting startups to work with corporates is um, accreditation. So those are so basic. If you ask me, um, having their books uh, properly done, um, getting their audits done uh, regularly, even generally monitoring it starts with first first with proper recording <laughs> and monitoring their finances so a lot of filipino entrepreneurs look at finance or like say doing their books more from the compliance perspective rather than using um, your financial statements as a tool for you to make decisions have you found success running Accelerate, your Accelerator idea space to get entrepreneurs to care more about that? Oh, well, that's a big emphasis for idea space. Um, it's, it's a part of our brand. If you graduate a startup, we want to make sure that they understand the importance of uh, that part of the startup. It's, it's not just the tech, it's not just how sexy the solution is or how, how large an impact, a social impact it has. But um, if your finances are like what we call stewardship of resources is not in place, then uh, you're, not, you're not the ideal idea space startup founder that we would like in the community. So for for us, oh, I can only speak for idea space. We look at four factors. One is a the strong founding team, particularly a team that has uh, high self awareness. Um, we say that if a founder doesn't have uh, is not self aware, that founder will not be able to draw up a good financial plan. So people say, what? <laughs> What's the connection. I said, because if you don't know where strengths and your weaknesses, you would not be able to draw up the right financial plan because you wouldn't know what kind of people to bring into the team if you don't know what your strengths or weaknesses are. Because if you know your strengths, why would you bring someone with the same strength into your team? So you probably will bring in pers a person who will complement your weakness. And that weakness is that going to be acquired? Are you going to uh, bring the other person um, as a co-founder? So it has to start from a self-aware founder and a co-founding team. And second emphasis for us is understanding the customer or the market. How well do you understand the market? So over the years, we... so. To select the startups that are into our program, we have a call for applications. So what we noticed is that people have this great idea, but it's an idea looking for a problem. <laughs> so we, um, on, our, on our third year, we reshifted to focus on people who really understand the problem. Um, so and how well they know the customer. So uh, the third is um, uh, teams that can build the product themselves from at the start when you, because we're, we're early stage. 
also because they have to understand uh, what it takes to build a product and how much it really costs. And then later on, um, they can hire in people or they can partner with a software development house. Um, but at least um, we would like to find get far, uh, founders who can build uh, the solutions themselves at the in the beginning, and third is and fourth fourth is uh, probably the most important for us is uh, for our founders who are very mindful and very good stewards of resources. So it isn't just because uh, it's preparing them to take in external funding, but it's also recognizing their co-founders contribution to the startup. I think a good steward of resources, a good co-founder will appreciate and recognize, say, a co-founder's um, time, um, the network that he brings into the startup, or um, his years of expertise into the startup. So um, that those are the four four factors that we look into. Very diligent. I wonder if that's why you're seeing so much traction this year in terms of the VCs. So tell me a little bit more about that. Where do you think that came from? Uh, the traction from the VCs. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned earlier, you're seeing a lot more funding coming in. It's kind of late compared to the other countries in Southeast Asia. <laughs> if maybe we maybe 10 years ago philippines and indonesia were in the same maybe face in development but then indonesia has um indonesia has um, developed so much faster than the philippines i think it's it's really the evolution of the ecosystem it's just starting to get uh the number of people who who are able to run a startup, a, a, um, a startup that uh, maybe VCs will feel more comfortable with, um, people who are better at risk management. Um, I think there is a big factor of, of the um, foreign developed talent. So people who have lived abroad, uh, been exposed to more mature ecosystems or more mature yeah, economies um, and come, have come back to build something here. I think there's a big factor there. They, these, these startup founders are also more familiar with how to raise capital and therefore they are able to you know, address the needs of the venture capitalists um, in uh, when when they're you know when they're searching for the right founders. In the end, if you ask the VCs, it's still it's still the founding team. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the trend you're talking about: Filipinos from abroad coming back home. That was a big part of the Indonesia ecosystem too. You think about Gojek, the initial founders. They studied abroad, the other really famous education startup, the founders were Harvard educated. So I'd imagine when in the Philippines, similar type of style in getting traction and getting confidence in other markets. Sadly, for example, in Africa, you're seeing a lot of these founders aren't even from Africa. They're actually folks from the UK, from the US working in Africa. So it is a bit of a different dynamic, but I think like you mentioned all over the world, a lot of these startup ecosystems are either natives or foreigners who maybe studied in areas that have a strong ecosystem and then coming back. What I think is going to happen is, um, so I mentioned about earlier about the, the hyper-local solutions developed by locals. I think there's going to be um, an exchange between 
these hyper local startups and also an intersection with the uh, startups that are developed by people who say who have had in influence or have come from abroad. So there's going to be like a, a some osmosis that's going to happen. And um, when that happens, I think that's going to be very exciting already for the Philippines because then there will be the replication and uh, that um, confidence of the hyperlocal uh, developed startups to venture into other provinces, other regions, and hopefully uh, brave enough to go beyond the Philippine shores. I think also what's happening now. Um, because you know, VCs also want to see the interest of the local investment community. There are more family offices now looking at investing in the Philippine startups. So unlocking that cash from, from uh, uh, the local investment community or lo yeah, local money, I think is going to be key. It's a chicken and an egg, though. I remember going to Colombia. They're like, yeah, we need local investors. But local investors look abroad to the Sequoias to know where to put their money. So if Sequoia doesn't come in, then local investors don't put their money in. So what do you think is going to need to break? Yeah. I think because of COVID. Um, a lot of so a lot of the old traditional money was invested in food and food. Um, food. Yeah, a lot of Filipinos invest in food, restaurants, and then um, real estate because maybe maybe yeah, maybe real estate is not very exciting now uh, with COVID, right? So especially like commercial establishments, people who Though that's that's a real cash cow for traditional real estate investors, right? They have a strip mall and then just continuously um, uh, just uh, collect the rent every month, every year, and the family divides the the profits at the end of the year. I'm seeing more of these people who have invested in real estate going into tech. So the other day I was speaking to one Chinese Filipino uh, guy and um, I asked him, how, so how did you convince your dad to invest in tech? He said, well, we have this one bank account. It doesn't move at all. I mean, it's it, it, the, the rent just that they earn from from this uh, real estate that they have just goes into a bank account and he said the interest isn't moving much so he convinced his dad to put part of that money into tech so i think that's the exciting thing now is the next generation are are able to influence their fathers or, or their uncles to invest into tech so Little by little, that's 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 going to unlock, and there's a lot of money there. And what about the angel investment scene in the Philippines? The angel investment community needs a little bit more maturity, or need, they we need to have more angel groups. They also need to be educated uh, about investing in tech. It isn't like investing in a building where you have the first floor and then you can if your foundation is strong enough you have the second floor <laughs> or so they it's funny because um you have to explain to them that tech is is not like that or sometimes you really have to tear down the entire building to have to prepare for the next uh, level of the tech. So they, they, they panic by saying, oh God, we spent six months developing the technology and you're going to tear it down completely. What happens to all that capital that we put in? You know, they're worried that, that uh, their money will never come back. So um, 
there's a bit of education that needs to be done with the angel investment community. Um, I think it's really key. It's, it's really key to a startup ecosystem. It's not only, it's not the VCs because the VCs will come in at the later stage, right? So at the very early stage, when especially when you're talking about the Philippines, which is generally a very a, a young tech ecosystem, um, the, the involvement of the angel investors is key. That's a good point. Government is also an important part. And I well, in fairness, I think the government is really um, working hard, especially the Department of, of Science and Technology and the Department of Trade and Industry. Those those two what initiatives? Those two government agencies. Um well we have uh, we're though we're late compared again to the other startup ecosystems, we finally have a law uh, that will uh, put into uh, has put in has been put into place. Uh, that law will re- be um, is important so that government agencies can allot money for the um, development of the startup ecosystem and um, tax incentives um, as well as um, maybe. Uh, visas for foreign talent to come in that's really important also because there's there's the larger startups they still need to source tech talent from say eastern europe or or russia or india interesting is that a trend the more well-known filipino startups are sourcing from east asia east europe i think it's because there's a lack of talent so they need to source it outside. As I said earlier, it's connected again to exits. So with, with more startups that are more mature and going to exits, that means the local talent is also developing. So there's, um, it's going to take an evolution uh, of more and more startups so that there will be more and more tech talent that will develop locally before we finally probably um, don't need to source from other parts of the world. But I think, you know, this is a, getting to be a smaller and smaller world. So there are parts of the world that probably have developed tech talent that are very good in one aspect of the tech. <laughs> and then another part of the world where there's, uh, they can source the tech in, uh, I mean, the tech talent from, Say India is good at something, and Thailand good at something, or or Eastern Europe good at something. So it's getting to be a smaller world. Yeah, that's true. A country shouldn't and doesn't need to depend on its own local tech talent to build great startups. If there's, like you said, great business acumen from a Filipino founder, and they bring in the whole technical team from another country, which a lot of uh, US companies actually do. Like you mentioned, hiring from Eastern Europe, they hire from there initially because the talent, the tech talent there is cheaper. So I think that could be really promising. I'd really like to see more Filipinos uh, build companies. We have one of the lowest uh, business densities in the country in southeast asia what does that mean like least number of new Uh, the number yeah the number of businesses um versus the population do you think that has to do with more on the regulation side maybe it's really hard to start a business or more on the people's ambition side where it's like i'm not interested in starting a new business both yeah, both. Um, a lot of Filipinos are raised to be employees mm. rather than entrepreneurs. So the parents um, ingrain in the minds of the young to get a job, go to school, get a job. So that is starting to decrease, but still a large number of people aspire to be an employee more than to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, so the the data, so in terms of business density, so if you like look at birth rate in the Philippines, we 
where if you compare VIP in you know, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, the Philippines has the highest birth rate, like 2.64 births per woman versus Indonesia has 2.31, Vietnam has 2.09. But in terms of business identity, like the number of businesses for every 1,000 persons in the, in the population, the Philippines has the lowest. Vietnam has 1.1 businesses per 1,000 person. And then Indonesia has 0 0.3. And then the Philippines is 0 0.29. So if you look at the Philippines versus Indonesia, oh, it's just a 0 0.01 difference. But that 0 0.01 difference is a whole big difference. If you look at what's happening in Indonesia now versus the Philippines, um, <laughs> it's... And especially since the population in Indonesia is so much bigger, so even if that ratio is smaller. Like you mentioned, it's an evolution and you guys are on this really exciting journey, especially as VC money comes in. So let's to end it on a high note. What are some startups in the recent years that have been thriving? I mean, we talked about one coins.ph that had the acquisition. Are there others we should know? I think the education space is a very exciting part. Um, Ed tech. Is there any companies in particular? I'll be biased with um, thinking of an idea space startup. There's one called Front Learners um, and uh, two others um, also called Wella and uh, Orange Apps. Those are the three tech startups, ed tech startups that are on top of my mind. Um, Front Learners has been recognized as one of the 10 exciting uh, ed tech startups in the Philippines, or I think in Southeast Asia. I think again, in the B2B space, it's also really exciting. Um, we have two startups that I think it just come to my mind um, are in the efficiency space, really helping businesses um, monitor their people, uh, monitor the- What are they called? Um, one is called Tarki. Yeah, it's a field force, um, field force optimization. So make, you know, um, <laughs> monitoring your people in the field because there's a lot of, um, as I said, you know, Philippines is so fragmented, um, just moving people from one, one province to the other region or there's just, just, just a lot of logistics happening. So monitoring where your people are, where your goods are, where your trucks are, uh, et cetera. That, that's uh, exciting. What are people using for e-commerce? Oh, e-commerce is also very exciting. <laughs> Again, yeah, a lot of um, e-commerce solutions are, are popping up. Yeah. What are people using? They, well... There's your usual large platforms, like there's a Lazada and the, there's Shopify and all of that. But then there's also lots of small, oh, sorry, the, the hyper local solutions. I think GovTech or government tech is also very exciting for the Philippines because there's just so many government processes that need to be automated are that need to go online. So like top of my mind is uh, a company called Taxumo and they are helping people, uh, sole proprietors file their taxes. So <laughs> yeah, so, um, and it's um, been, they've been uh, supported by the Bureau of uh, Internal Revenue. So recognized by the Internal Revenue, the, Bureau that they really need solutions like that. So there are so many government processes that um, need to be automated, like even paying your real estate tax um, is uh, largely done uh, over the counter and not online. So there's a huge opportunity there. So if anyone listening to this call is a startup or um, a 
an investor, I think, I think if you look into the inefficiencies in the Philippines, you'll see a lot of opportunity there. <laughs> a lot of opp yeah. opportunity. <laughs> The euphemism of problems, inefficiencies into opportunities. I love it. And what about the and what about the fintech space? What tools are people using for remittances and just peer to peer payments? Startup ecosystem. The first sub ecosystem to form a formal, let's say, chamber of commerce. Like I said, the old term is chamber of commerce. Like a uh, as a formal sector is the fintech space. So there's a lot of growth in, in payments. So they're the big, there are two big ones, um, big players, which are backed by the telcos. So there's Paymaya that's backed by PLDT. And then there's um, Gcash that's backed by Globe. But then there are also strong contenders and players like um, coins.ph. And then there's so many other fintech solutions that cater to certain verticals. So like say, for example, Quickwire is a um, payment solution for specifically for real estate. There are a lot of Filipinos who buy real estate properties. So the Filipinos from abroad and then buy properties locally so that you know their their earnings that they're making while they're abroad are going to an investment so many invest in real estate um, so they need that payment uh, gate the payment gateway is that the right term um, to to send their remittance to pay for those um, those monthly amortization so um, there are so many ways. There's also this company called Beam and Go. They, um, it's a social enterprise for foreign, foreign remittance also to go directly to pay me, paying for groceries at home or for, um, for um, paying tuition fee for, for the kids. So there's so many... Uh, solutions coming up uh, for for different needs. So fascinating. Yeah, I know fintech is moving really quickly, and even the international companies focused on remittances are very focused on the Philippines because they know how strong remittances are there. Like Remitly, I know they're doing some things there, and yeah. So a lot of people investing in the Filipino tech ecosystem even if it's not local but yes yes yeah you know i i also like say i am biased for something locally developed but i think it's part of the growth of the ecosystem if there are foreign companies coming in um i think it's you know if it's just a sign that if there are the local ones don't move fast enough, the ones from abroad that are probably more mature will come come in because in the end it's the customer who 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 who's most comfortable with the technology and if the more mature technology will definitely win um, over uh, a buggy <laughs> buggy technology. But we're all hoping for the local Filipino startup to lead the ecosystem instead of a bunch of foreign intrusion. So Diane, thank you so much for spending your time and educating us about the ecosystem, getting us really excited. And for the listeners out there, if there's any interest in investment in working with local startups, their partnerships, Diane is your go-to person. <laughs> oh yeah we're willing to share i mean we're really happy to uh, start the conversation with uh, whoever is interested in learning more about the philippines uh, just send me an email it's easy diane at ideaspacefoundation.org thanks for joining us today on the emerging markets tech startup show if you have questions comments requests for me to cover an emerging market 
or want to be connected with today's guest, leave me a comment in the reviews or find me on Twitter at Diana Yao. Until next time, 